justified because justified goes far more beyond just saying you're forgiven because I can forgive you of something and still have in the back of my mind the thing that I forgave you of. But if, if I justify you, that word justify means just as if I'd never sinned. In other words, if, if God justifies us, that means he sees us as if we never sinned. It's not like he sees us and thinks about the things that he forgave us of. No, he looks at us and he sees us as innocent, born of innocence. He makes you not just forgiven, but completely innocent. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It's good to know that Jesus died on the cross, but when we think about Jesus dying on the cross, what does that mean to you? I think a lot of people, if you say, well, Jesus died for you, or Jesus went to the cross for you, that doesn't really mean a lot to them because they don't really understand why somebody would need to go to the cross and die for them. So when he says, it is finished, what did he mean by it is finished? Why did Jesus have to go to the cross? And it's important for us to understand why it was, why it was significant and what he accomplished. What was accomplished when Jesus went to the cross? Well, today I'm going to talk about the first thing that was accomplished, and that's the new birth. The miracle of the new birth. Now, this is a, a word or a phrase that we use frequently, and again, it's one of those things that unless someone really explains it to you, it, it might just be one of those religious-sounding phrases that you don't really know what it means. But I'm going to explain to you what the miracle of the new birth is. Jesus introduced this word or this phrase he said that, most assuredly, I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I hope we all want to see the kingdom of God, and all of us perhaps have experienced the kingdom of God in our lives in one way or another. What does it mean? What did he mean that you must be born again? I'm going to explain it to you in, in this way. I want to share with you eight things. When you're born again, the new birth makes you, and there's eight of these things that the new birth makes you. After I share these eight things, I'll share with you more specifically how to become born again. But the new birth makes you a new creation. This is based upon 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. When we talk about being born again, the new birth, this is the greatest miracle. You know, it's great when we see people get healed or get delivered or, or receive all kinds of miracles. But the greatest miracle ever the greatest miracle, miracle of all is to be born again. When you're born again, literally, your spirit is literally recreated. Your spirit being, that's the innermost part of you, you are a three-part being, spirit, soul, and body. Being born again doesn't affect your body. That was the mistake Nicodemus asked in the next verse, which in verse 4 he says, well, how can someone re-enter into his mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus makes it clear he wasn't talking about a physical birth. Being born again has nothing to do with the body, not directly anyway. The, the body isn't changed instantly. The, the soul isn't changed. Your soul being your mind, your will, and your emotions, they begin a process of changing. But the thing that changes instantly, where it says here, if you're in Christ, you are a new creation, that's specifically talking about your spirit, the spirit being, the spirit part of you, the innermost part of you, the real you, we could say. Because the real you isn't your body, that's just your earth suit. The real you isn't your soul. Again, that's your mind, your will, and your emotions. The real you, the very breath of you, is the spirit. After being born again, we have true citizenship in heaven because we are recreated. We are born of God. When we say being born again, it's the spirit part of you that is born, birthed from God. And so when you're born again, you have the very power and nature and authority of God himself residing within you. You are birthed from him. It says, if anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. That sounds like you should see an instant change in everything about your life, but that's not what it's saying. Now, I have known people that have been instantly changed, drastic changes in their personalities, drastic changes in their, in their likes and dislikes after they're born again, but that didn't happen to me. And let me just give a, a very brief testimony of my new birth experience. I remember way back when I believe I was eight years old that I responded to an altar call. I might have been nine, but I think I was eight. I responded to an altar call. and But the only reason I really responded to that altar call was because my sister did. And, and, I, and other family members did. And I felt like, well, this must be the thing to do. You know, I want to be 
in on everything else that everything God wants me to be in on. So I responded to the altar call, but it was really more, I don't know if I would call it peer pressure, but it was more because I thought that that was the thing to do. I responded to the altar call, but it didn't really mean anything to me because I, I didn't really even know what I was doing. So as time went by, I began to pay more attention to, to spiritual matters a little bit and try to read the Bible a little bit. Heard testimonies of people that have been saved and their lives are radically changed. Well, my life wasn't radically changed, so I thought, well, nothing must have happened. Even though I responded to the altar call, nothing happened. And so over the, the next few years, between age 8 and age 13, I was thinking that I, I mustn't be born again because nothing changed. And so each time I would respond to the altar call, I still wouldn't see any change, so nothing must have happened, right? I kept responding to altar calls from time to time. It's not like I did every Sunday, but, but it, probably at least once or twice a year I would respond to an altar call. And I remember at, at nighttime going to bed frequently, I would, I would be frightened, I would be scared, because I knew all these sermons, a, a very common theme in sermons back then was Jesus is coming back. In fact, one of my favorite preachers he preached very strongly that for sure the way the world is going and the way prophecies are being fulfilled, Jesus Christ is going to return before 1980. Aren't some of you glad he didn't return before 1980? Um, but he was certain of that. He preached it passionately, and I believed it. You know, Jesus is returning before 1980, so I need to make sure that I'm saved. And I was scared to death that Christ was going to return and I was going to be left behind. But still, as much as I asked Jesus to save me, I didn't feel anything, so I didn't believe anything happened. I guess over the process of time, I heard enough teaching that the day before my 13th birthday, July 28, 1973, I got together with a very close friend of mine, and I, I discussed with him my fears and my concerns, and he led me in a prayer. And this time, I, I just made up my mind that I can't live my life in fear. Either God means what he says or he doesn't. So I'm just going to believe whether I feel anything or not. I know I'm not supposed to live by feelings. That time, I just decided I'm just going to believe I'm saved whether I feel like it or not. And once I made that decision, probably within 15 minutes, my heart was flooded with joy and peace that I hadn't experienced before. It seems like it all comes down to faith. What do you believe? If you believe you're not saved, then you're going to be living in fear and anxiety and all the problems of the world, but if you really believe that God means what he says, he will respond, but it takes faith. You have to just simply believe that he means what he says. The new birth makes you a new creation when you when you believe it by faith. So let's go, let's talk about a second thing that the new birth makes you. And I've got eight of these. I probably won't, I'll try not to spend that much time on each one. The new birth makes you righteous. Second Corinthians 5.21 says, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Not Again, God doesn't just forgive you. He makes you righteous. He makes you righteous. Okay, your righteousness isn't based upon what you do or what you don't do. Your righteousness, righteousness is imputed by God in Jesus Christ to you. Righteousness is imputed to you based upon what Jesus did on the cross, not based upon anything that you do. A third thing, the new birth makes you identified with Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, verses 5 and 6 says, Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised up together, raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, there's a lot, Paul, in a lot of Paul's writings, he makes references to the, he says, in Christ, or in him, or in whom, frequently, especially in the book of Ephesians. What is, the, what is the thing that you identify with more than anything else in life? Some people identify with their careers. You know, that is, you know, my identity is in my career. Other people might say, well, my identity is, the thing I most identify with is my video games <laughs> or my running, my hobbies, my, the sports of interest. What is the one thing that you identify with more than anything else? And I want to suggest to you that the one thing you should identify with is who you are in Christ. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. He chose us in Him. Th these, these phrases, in Christ, in Him, in whom, is seen throughout the book of Ephesians, especially chapter 1. In Him we have redemption through His blood. In Him also have obtained an inheritance. In Him you have trusted. We need to identify with who we are in Christ. We are in Jesus. 
We are in Christ. He is in us, but we are in him also. When we're born again, we are in Christ. And that needs to be our identity, who we are in Christ. There's a few more of these that I put up here. There's a lot more that I didn't put up here. But, but the Father of glory may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. But now, in Christ, Jesus, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ, in whom you have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. God in Christ forgave you. This is just a small sample of things that we have in Christ. We have an inheritance. We have, we can approach the throne of God with boldness and confidence through faith in Christ. The fourth thing that you have or the new birth makes you is spiritual authority. Luke 10, 19, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. Now this is true in the spiritual realm, but I believe it's also true in the natural realm. You don't need to be afraid of animals even. Bees and snakes and all kinds of things. You can walk with boldness and confidence and faith in God. You don't need to be afraid of any of these. And I, even in the natural realm. But I believe he's also talking about the spiritual realm. That you have power over the enemy, the spiritual enemy. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. You have authority in this life. This is something you get as a birthright. The sovereign God of the universe, the king of the universe is your father. Think about that. If you're born again, the creator of the world is your father. If, you, if we really grasped that and understood that, we wouldn't be afraid of anything or anybody, and we wouldn't fear financial problems. We wouldn't fear financial issues because we believe that God is our supply. Jesus is our supply, and he is, he is our father. The new birth makes you... God's representative. 2 Corinthians 5.20 Now then, not in the future, but now, now is an important word there, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now, what does it mean to be an ambassador? Our, our country, our government has ambassadors in many nations around the world. When you're an ambassador, you're living in another land, but you're not a citizen of that land, right? I mean, you are a citizen of your home country. We may have an ambassador in the um, United Kingdom and in France and in Brazil and all kinds of other countries around the world. They may be living in those countries, but they don't represent that country. They re represent us. So when they speak and when they go to uh, official meetings, they are representing their home government. Well, this is true with us. This is what Paul is telling us. God, through Paul, is telling us that we are ambassadors. If we're born again, if you're born again, you are an ambassador for God. You are an ambassador for the kingdom of God. This world, this earth, is not your home. You are here temporarily, but while you're here, you're representing the king of, of your homeland. The king, Father God. You're his son or daughter, but you're also his representative. You are his ambassador. And what do we do as, an, as ambassadors? It says here, through God, pleading through us, this is what we tell people, this is the message that we give people, the message from God, our king, from our, our homeland, he sends us as ambassadors to make this case. This is what we're supposed to tell people. We implore you, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. This is, In other words, it's like we're begging people, get right with God. On Christ's behalf, we're begging people, be reconciled to God. The sixth thing, the new birth makes you justified. This is one of my favorite words because, and, it, and I've talked about it a lot in the past few weeks, that it's not just being forgiven, but being justified. It's very similar to righteous. It's really basically saying the same thing. But justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Justified. God looks at you through the lenses of the blood of Jesus. God looks at you through the lenses of the blood of Jesus. He, he represents me in heaven and I represent him here on earth. Justification is a uh, judicial term describing man's legal standing before God. Man stands before God. God is the judge. You know, he's, he, he's the king. He's our father. He's also the judge. We stand before this judge, the judge of the whole earth. Without Christ, we stand before this judge guilty and condemned. Because of the blood of Jesus, Man is acquitted and declared righteous by the redemptive work of Jesus Christ on the cross. 
So man needs justification or righteousness. And if, if we're honest with ourselves, even when we do good deeds, we usually have selfish motives. We must receive God's righteousness. One purpose of the law was to reveal not just his righteousness, but, but reveal inability to, to keep the law of God in our consciousness of sin. God's righteousness is attained by grace through faith. Another thing, number seven here, is that the, the new birth makes you regenerated. Now that's a big fancy word, but let me explain what it means. It basically means born again. Uh, not of works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Referring to an inward act, an inward work of the Holy Spirit that he does, he imparts his divine life within us. He, do, he imparts his spirit within us. Regeneration is the new birth when the Holy Spirit baptizes us into the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit performs the new birth within us. It's wholly the work of God. And God cannot work without your willing expression of faith. God will not impose his will upon you. He will not impose his will upon your will. His, he will not force someone to be saved. God will lovingly present himself to you, but you must respond. This is true with, with all things that we receive from God. It takes, it takes faith. The eighth thing is God's temple. God's, or the new birth makes you the temple of God. I have three references for that. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? When you're born again, you are the house of God. You are the temple of God. You know, this building is not the temple of God or the house of God. Any church building that you go to is not the house of God. I've heard people say, well, you need to treat the house of God with respect, referring to the building. Well, the building is not the house of God. It's just a building. You are the house of God. You are the temple of God if you've been born again. If anyone defile the temple, 1 Corinthians 3, 17, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Okay, so he makes it clear. He's not talking about a building. You are the temple of God. Chapter 6, verse 19, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of God, or the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God, that you are not your own? You do not belong to yourself. You are not your own. You, and this, this specifically mentions your body. Okay, so it's not just your spirit. He considers your body his temple. Where Jesus said you must be born again. Let's look at it in its context. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now a few things I want to point out here about this. First of all, Nicodemus was a Pharisee. Now as, as a general rule and as an overall fact, the Pharisees were opposed to Jesus. But this is one Pharisee that was impressed by Jesus, but he was a little bit shy about approaching Jesus. What do I mean by that? It says he came to Jesus at night. Why did, why did this Pharisee come to Jesus at night? My assumption is that he wanted to come to Jesus secretly. He didn't want it to be publicly known that he was going to go talk to Jesus. So he came to Jesus at night, probably quite secretly, not wanting others to see him. It was a secret visit. But later on, we know that his, um, his love for truth led him to eventually become a Christian. We know that based upon other things that are said about Nicodemus later on in Scripture. But Nic Nicodemus at this point was very intrigued, very interested, very curious. He says that we know that you are a teacher from God. Now, when he says we, Rabbi, we know. Who's the we he's talking about? I assume he's talking about the Pharisees. We the Pharisees. We know that you're from God. So even the ones that wouldn't admit it outwardly, they knew intuitively that Jesus was sent from God. Now, I, I want you to pay attention to uh, the word no. Because the word no here is E-I-D-O, is the, is the spelling. To perceive intuitively or to have insight into. To perceive intuitively or have insight into. That's an important word. I'm going to come back to it in a minute. 
we perceive intuitively, intuitively and have insight into the fact that you are a teacher from God. For no one can do, I also want to take a look at this word can do. It, this is actually just one word in, in the Greek, can do. And it's the word dunamis. You, you familiar with the word dunamis? The dunamis power of God? A lot of times when, it, it's usually translated power. But here it's translated can do. It's the dunamis power of God. It's the, the supernatural power of God. God's power. In other words, Nicodemus is saying, the power of God that's so evident in your life is proof that you're from God. The miracles, the healings, the demonstration of God's power is proof that you are from God. No one can do, demonstrate the power of God the way you do unless he's from God. But then Jesus responds, and what's interesting about Jesus' response is he, he uses... Nicodemus' own words to answer the question. He said, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot. Now the word cannot is from the same word that the word can do is from. Okay, can do is dunamis, cannot is dunamaeu, and it's very similar to dunamis. It's from the same, same root word. So in other words, he's using Nicodemus' words to answer his own words to answer his question. And the word see here is the same word that's translated no and see. You might say, well, how can those be the same word? They're translated completely differently. Well, you can look it up in a Strong's Concordance. I was told that, and I looked it up myself to make sure that it's true, and it is true. It's translated no in verse 2, it's translated see in verse 3, but it's the exact same Greek word, spelled E-I-D-O, however you want to pronounce that. And it, again, it means to have insight into or to, intu to know something intuitively or to have insight into. So again, Jesus is using Nicodemus' own words to answer his question. So he's saying that unless you're born again, you cannot have insight into the kingdom of God. You can't know anything about the kingdom of God. You cannot have any intuition or, in other words, the insight or the intuition or the intuitive knowledge that you have was given to you by God. So, without the dunamis power of God, you cannot even have any insight into the kingdom of God. As Nicodemus said, How can a man be born, born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? So, obviously, he's thinking of natural terms, but Jesus is very clear that he's not talking about the natural realm. He says, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. So, he's clearly not talking about the body. That which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say that I said you must be born again. You cannot get people saved if they're unaware of the need to be saved. If they're content with their ways, there's not much you can do. You cannot help people find the Savior if they don't know that they're lost. The fact that Jesus went to the cross does not really mean a lot to a lot of people because they don't really see the significance of it. But Jesus lived that perfectly righteous life that we couldn't live, and then he took all of our sins upon himself. So he lived the perfectly righteous life that we couldn't live. He lived that life for us. And then he went to the cross and took all of our sins upon himself. Jesus accomplished a lot when he went to the cross. Jesus accomplished a lot. When he said it is finished, there's a lot in that, that, in that sentence. It is finished. But the first and most important thing that's contained in that sentence, it is finished, is the price of that was needed to pay for your sins was completed. The punishment for your sins was completed. The punishment for your sins, past, present, and future. There is not a sin that you'll commit in the future that will catch God by surprise. And God has already dealt with it. He's already paid for it in the body and blood of Jesus. Let's focus on this passage right here, Romans 10, verses 8 through 10. What does it say? The word is near you in your mouth, and in your heart. He's quoting from the Old Testament here. That is the word of faith that we preach. Sometimes we talk about the word of faith. What, is it, what does the word of faith mean? Well, this is the word of faith. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now this word saved is the Greek word sozo, which means saved, healed, delivered, or to be made whole. So whatever it is you, you need this morning, if it's the new birth that you need, if it's a healing you need, if it's a, a financial need, a relationship need, whatever your need is this morning, this is the principle of the word of faith, what, what Paul called the word of faith. 
on how to receive anything from God, really. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, so if you confess Jesus, in other words, speaking is important. What you say, you need to speak in agreement with God. Speak in agreement with God. Speak what God said in His Word. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart. Know that the word believe means to have faith. So in other words, you believe that what God said is true. Don't go by your feelings. Don't go by your emotions. Don't, go, don't allow yourself to fear. Don't allow yourself to worry. But just simply believe that what God said is true. Just accept it. Believe it. Rest in it. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. Healed, delivered, made whole. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So when people talk about word of faith, it's primarily talking about two components. What you speak and what you believe. Speak in agreement with God. Believe in agreement with His word. There's no magic in the words. This is what you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. But the believing part is a very important part of it. And you can... Somebody could lead you through a sinner's prayer or, or confession, and if you don't really believe it, it's pointless. It doesn't do anything. Okay? It's like Jesus went to the cross in your place, but if you don't believe it, it doesn't do you any good. God makes us new. This is all God's plan in the first place. And new literally means recreated, um, regenerated. And uh, this is in the word born. And it's also, um, you know, you have the meaning of... Um, you have the meaning of being born as a natural born, like, you know, when you have the list of people who were born after, you know, their father. father. So we said, for instance, uh, uh, an Adam begat, so on and so forth, as his, his, uh, his children. So that begat and born is the first meaning of born. And, uh, but we have also a second meaning that is recreated. So we're not talking about the first birth, the natural birth that we get from our um, earthly parents. Uh, we're talking about a different birth. So in Ezekiel 11, uh, 19, so here we have a stony heart out of their flesh. So uh, it means that, you know, to start with, our hearts are just dead. And, um, and they have nothing like, uh, uh, like uh, nothing that, that, that comes from God. Uh, because uh, as we saw last, last time, uh, we have creation, you know, when we started sinning. Um, we definitely got cut off from God and, and separated from Him, so uh, our spirit died. So our hearts were just, uh, as it is said here, um, just stony hearts. So when we're born again, first of all, that new birth means that we are made new and that we have been recreated, but now that we are spiritually alive. And when we're born again, God puts His Spirit in our spirit and He seals them together. Ephesians 1.13 there's an order in things. Um, the sealing of that Holy, Holy uh, Spirit is done after the believing. So um, after we are born again, uh, we also learn that our true citizenship is in heaven. And our citizenship is in heaven. Why? Because Romans 6, 4 says that we are seated in heaven with Christ. When did we sit down in heaven with Christ? When Christ died and went um, to his Father, he took us with us because we were buried with him through the baptism uh, into his death and also into his resurrection. So when he sat at the right hand of the Father, uh, so did we uh, in him. So this is why we uh, we belong to heaven. Our citizenship is in is in heaven. Amen. So um, the uh, the next point that uh, that you can see on your on your notes is that the new birth. Um, makes us uh, different. Experience, you know, of the new creature and the new creation varies from one person to another person, but it is definitely something that we don't feel in, 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 in our body, like there's no physical changes or anything like this. It is just, it, it is a spiritual transformation. So what happens is that it manifests, it can manifest inside and usually there's a great joy. Uh, some people just just talk about the fact that it was very uh, very very simple for them. Um, you know, it's not it's it's not like we are looking after any experience per se or or any feelings or anything of that sort. It's just that we believe, and uh, the same as um, you know, we believe in the fact that we are saved uh, because God makes us believe that. Uh, we also believe that the change um, has been done. So what kind of change are we talking about? We're talking about the Spirit of God living inside of us and, um, and uh, all things like the condemnation, the separation, uh, all of those things have been made new. So uh, not only um, the newness of people, of us, of believers, 
is done into uh, you know our spiritual uh, inside of us in our hearts, but it's also in our mind and and in all the parts of us that. Uh, that we've been made new. Now, what happens is in reality uh, that newness sometimes is not real to us uh, because we are uh, we've been very flesh, uh, fleshly uh, oriented people, very carnal people, feeling with our you know our five senses and our emotions and what we see and is uh, talks volume. But um, as we uh, as we get to that transformation and as we pray and as we want to have a communion and a life, a deeper life. Uh, with uh, with Christ, uh, what happens is that uh, we step more and more into the spiritual realm, and we uh, see that this is this is real. And um, so all things have passed, and all things are becoming new, and this is wonderful because for some of them, uh, the experience that were uh, that we had in the past were so uh, so uh, miserable and poor that uh, here we're just we're just new people. We just don't have to look at ourselves the way we used to. Um, and God t uh, keeps uh, keeps on telling us through His Word, so that's important here to read the Word, uh, so that we uh, can have our mind. Um, start to um, register and understand um, the true, the true uh, value of that transformation, uh, the way God sees it, not the way we see it. All things have passed, and all those things, all new things are coming as we uh, progress into the uh, fellowshipping uh, with the Lord and reading the Word. Uh, we uh, we see some some great uh, great changes. We have also become new um, uh, God's represent representatives, and as Pastor was reading the uh, the passage, we are now ambassadors for Christ. And um, an ambassador is is somebody who represents, you know, his government. Here we are representing Christ, and uh, what a privilege it is. And we uh, not only do we represent Him, but we represent His kingdom. That is to say, His ways, what He does, and how He does it. And um, we have access also to the uh, the throne of God, which we didn't have before. Christ is right there, and um, because He intercedes for us and He's um, our advocate, uh, there is no more uh, separation between God and, uh, and us. We've been reconciled to Him, so we can go boldly to the uh, the throne and and cry to Him, Abba, Abba, help here, help whenever we uh, we need. So in Mark 16. Um, the sat, he sat on the um, the right hand. So the right hand is really, as we uh, we uh, touched on that a little bit last week, uh, the right is a righteousness. Uh, there's something about being seated at the right hand of God, and that's only for the righteous, um, the most righteous uh, uh, per person ever, which is uh, which is um, Jesus, that was made man, and of course. Uh, who was always God. Uh, so uh, the righteousness here is God's righteousness that we receive. It has nothing to do with uh, what we want to do or, or how, how bad we want it or anything like this because it's just from God and not from us. So um, the reason why we are made righteous also is um, thanks to Jesus. So um, because he's the righteousness of God made flesh and, and we are uh, the, the people who believe in him and um, and who confess that he's uh, he's a Christ and, and uh, the Son of God, um, you know, the from their heart, of course, not just a confession of the of the mind. Uh, this is all. Everything that has to do with God is is uh, pertains to the heart, not 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 really to the mind, because uh, the mind is is the mind is the reflection. The mind the mind gets. Um, gets gets affected by everything that has to do from the this world and uh, and the heart also as well in some in some part but um, God deposits things inside of us in that heart and and he that's what he looks at we deserve nothing uh, you know it's not because we were good it's not because uh, you know we uh, we um, we could make a difference and uh, it's not uh, it has nothing to do with us and the um, the goal of this and of it all is really to uh, to be reminded that without God we are nothing, and uh, and without His gift and His love and what He wants to provide to us, uh, we can get absolutely nothing. So uh, that keeps us very humble. That keeps us in our place, you know. And uh, but that place also um, is a wonderful place because as much as we remember that we are nothing, He has given us everything. So. Uh, here it says that we are made alive with Christ, uh, even when we were dead in our transgressions, and it is by grace that we have been saved. So mm -hmm. this is a grace of God that uh, that does that uh, for us. And there again we see that we've been uh, that God raises up with Christ 
and uh, we are sitting with him in um, in the heavenly realm. So uh, there again, we are uh, uh, we are citizens of heaven. So Christ uh, Christ is clearly our own advocate here in heaven, and uh, we are his vessels here on earth, and um, and uh, we are his his hands and his feet, and uh, we are very uh, very blessed and, and, and privileged to uh, to be doing that. You know everything that. Adam and Eve were given in the Garden of, e of Eden. Uh, we have the same things. So, um, you know, Satan has been defeated, and uh, he's a de de defeated foe now. And uh, we also have the authority to uh, to uh, on, on on animals that, that are deadly, and um, and we also have authority over all the powers of uh, of the enemy. So uh, we need not look at the enemy as you know controlling us or or just ruling us or like like he used to before we were saved, but um, he can he can really do nothing. Now the uh, the trick about this is really that we have to wrap our understanding and our mind around this. And there again, you know, between the um, um, the, uh, the reading of the word, praying God, uh, and understanding and trusting and having a communion, a deeper communion uh, with God, we, we we learn to to trust Him more and more, and we see that uh, that trust is uh, is really uh, important and and surpasses uh, you know the uh, the acts of the devil, and uh, and so it's a, it's a great it's a great understanding and, and realization that uh, we cannot be. Uh, touched or harm in any way. And here it says, for God so loved the world. It didn't say for God so loved the, 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 the Israelites, the Jewish people or, or the Gentiles, but everyone, absolutely everyone. Mm -hmm. But um, he gave his only son and his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, you know, should not perish. So, uh, so it's really uh, um, believing believing and the kingdom of God is is a realm of God so that's to, that is to say everything that pertains to um, to God his ways his uh, his um, his attributes uh, who he is how he does things and um, that would be the um, the, um, the very uh, very uh, limited but uh, basic approach approach on the kingdom of God so uh, without the uh, the power of God the dynamis power of God uh, we cannot have any insight. Uh, into the, the the kingdom of God. He gives more uh, explanation about being born again. He said, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So born of water, um, as I was uh, researching, because I kept on thinking and having in mind that Jesus is talking to a um, to a, uh, a Jew, a Pharisee, and so he's 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 trying to um, he's trying to bring his explanation to the light of what that man has experienced and knows. And, um, and so I did some research in the Old Testament and I found uh, that, you know, the living water given by Jesus um, first of all, for us, you know, and, and for the uh, for the New Testament people, as uh, as they were living with Jesus, is ex is expressed in the baptism of the water. But I went back, and we read that also uh, in the experience of the woman at the well. But I went back to the Old Testament to find out what kind of uh, of water we were talking about there, and if there was any uh, any uh, any relationship between uh, uh, the water that he's talking about and the water that the uh, the uh, Israelites uh, could have heard and known about. So in Exodus 17:6, um, I think the, the, the Lord the answered Moses, "Go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb." Strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. Yes. So here we've got a beautiful illustration of you know Jesus being the the, the rock, and the water you know flowing out of that rock. And as we learn more about this, um, Jesus is actually the living water. And as I said it before, you know, the woman at the well uh, is also asking for, uh, um, is also uh, wondering about that water. And Jesus tells her that he's the uh, living water and that no one will thirst after drinking that water. And also that, you know, through, um, from the inside will flow um, rivers of uh, living waters. And there we're talking about the uh, Holy Spirit. 
and um, and uh, the uh, the power that is inside. Uh, so we 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 definitely see that Christ and the Holy Spirit are just together, and um, we get Jesus, but we also get the Holy Spirit, and then we'll see later on how you know this uh, living water flowing out of out of a person and uh, is is through the uh, the Holy Spirit. So born of the Spirit, spiritual matters also can only be um, you know accessible by spiritual beings. So if we are carnal, if we are you know uh, in the flesh, uh, we are not going to have access to that. And um, here it says that to be born of the Spirit gives access to the spirit realm, and being ba baptized in the Holy Ghost is like opening a door. Um, that was closed before, and that door. As soon as you um, you um, you are baptized in the in the Holy Spirit, it's like a room opens up. The door opens up to a room, and that room is full of treasures, and uh, you can have access to them. And uh, having access to them means that you know you can enjoy the sozo life that Jesus died and um, to give us and uh, on earth. So um, it means also that as a Christian, you will be equipped to live the Christian life like God wants wants you and us to to live um, on this on this earth. So um, it also say that you know when you're born of water and the Spirit, uh, unless you are born, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. So entering the kingdom uh, in the first portion of the scripture, it says that unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom, and then it says enter. So enter is really, um, you know, to uh, to be fully part of that kingdom and and uh, to have the benefits of that kingdom as being son and daughters of the king, and uh, the king being of course our God and the son of daughters us uh, when we're born again. We uh, there's an, a very important point though that we've seen as we uh, read all of the scriptures is. Um, uh, you know, it's it's a necessity to uh, to know that how to get saved because uh, uh, if you are unaware of the need, um, you know you're going to be uh, probably content in your ways. But you have to you have to understand that uh, it's it's our, our our responsibility to let people know that there is that salvation. And, and that it's, um, it's a wonderful thing for them. So we cannot help people find the Savior if they don't know that they are lost. And some people are just very content with their, their lives, their, 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 their jobs, their, their, the money they make, their family, and they just don't never search for anything because they may not have the desire or they just may not know altogether. And, um, and you also cannot get people to be born again if they don't know that they are condemned. And um, I think that out there we also have many different versions, uh, but it is clear that uh, you know, God doesn't want anybody to perish. Um, but there is a way to perish. And if you refuse uh, or if you reject uh, the gift of, of Jesus, uh, then there are some consequences as uh, being, uh, being separated eternally from God. The new birth is, um, is the only path to uh, righteousness and true holiness. It is very clear here that man is in need of uh, holiness, and we are all in need of that. So Hebrew 12, 14 talks about following peace with all men and holiness, and with that uh, which no man shall see the Lord. So uh, you will never get any more righteous than the day uh, that you are saved. In other words, the righteousness that we get, there's no perfection to it because it's already God's righteousness, so it's perfect to start with. And we walk in what we already have and who we already are. Uh, we also have, you know, uh, that is deposited inside of us, um, a holy nature, and uh, which enables us to uh, pursue a, a holy lifestyle. And uh, there are things that start to bother us uh, that didn't bother us before, like you know, watching television, watching some programs, speaking, cursing, and things like that that uh, start bothering us inside. And uh, this is what we um, we are talking about here. And God's goal in your life and in mine is to get us to walk in the fullness of who He has already made us to be. So um, walking in the in the blessing of uh, you know the spiritual blessing and the social life that uh, I was talking about before. Uh, walking in peace, in love, walking in health, walking in prosperity, uh, walking in everything that God has uh, deposited. And uh, we will see that uh, in further um, in, in, uh, in lessons 
uh, later on. So uh, the birth is the only means of entrance. So we were born by the will of God, uh, born also by the gospel, born by faith. So it says, you know, what, what is it that we must do to be saved? Believe. So believe is, is trust, is, is have faith uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, you and your house. So um, this is wonderful because uh, the salvation is also uh, given to, uh, to the members of, uh, of our family. And uh, there's only one mediator, and this is Jesus. And in 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, uh, Christ Jesus. So the man, the word the man is really interesting because uh, it's actually uh, as he came, you know, as uh, in the flesh and did all of this. Um, you know, he won, he got the right to be seated right there at the, uh, the right hand of God because of the sacrifice that he made and as a man. And all of that was, of course, for us. Jesus is the way. So anybody who says that, you know, they believe in God, they have God and so on and so forth. Yes. Uh, you know, but the only access and the, 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 the true, um, the, the only relationship that you can have, uh, you know, is through Jesus. And all of those benefits uh, that he's talking about is only through Jesus. So um, Jesus is also, uh, so we were lost in Adam, but we were restored in Christ. As we know, Adam was the one who sinned. And, uh, and uh, of course, we uh, then uh, became separated from God. But we got restored in Christ. And we can see that through uh, Genesis 3.15, uh, when God was saying that uh, he will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So this is talking about, about Jesus right here that uh, is, restoring, uh, is restoring us. Genesis 3.24, so he drove out the man, God drove out uh, Adam and Eve, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Uh, so the tree of life was saved and uh, for later, and uh, Jesus, of course, is... Uh, is our restoration and our tree of life. But God there again in his righteousness is always ready to uh, take anybody back. And uh, there's never any uh, any um, eternal condemnation as long as we're on earth and, and, and we're looking for the truth and searching the, the, for the truth like uh, Nicodemus or anybody else. And uh, so uh, we can turn our ways and uh, always, and, and God is always there. And the justification uh, is was the work of Christ. And it's still the work of Christ when we uh, decide to uh, to give our lives to um, to Christ. It's a judicial term describing man's legal standing before God, and it's also just as if uh, we had never sinned. And I think it's really neat um, because we're just wonderful. And, and the relationship between God and us, you know, uh, vertically now is that God doesn't see uh, us as sinful uh, nature, our sinful nature, because our sinful nature is, is gone. And he just sees Christ inside of us now. We, we are just new creature. The man's need for justification. Uh, we also know that we cannot be righteous on our own. Justification and righteous, justified and, 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 right, and, and righteous are really uh, similar terms. Everything that God has offered and offers uh, can never be attained by working. Uh, why? It's because we would just therefore go back to our old um, our old nature, trying, trying, trying and failing. Why? It's because this is God's doing, has been done at the cross, and everything that he has done, we don't need to do it again. We don't need to, 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 to struggle. We don't need to try. We just need to rest. And, um, and this is also a concept that takes time for, uh, for us to understand. But um, he gives us grace uh, to attain and to do the things that he wants us to do. So um, it is, it is a, a, um, a work of faith. There's also always, you know, when we try things, there's always an element of pride. And, you know, the, uh, the sinful, the sinful uh, world in which we live, the pride is, is omnipresent. It's there all around us. You know, it's, it's, it's constant. It's like we want to control. We want to make our decisions. We want to be on, on you know, in command and in, 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 in have, uh, have our, our life into our hands. But it's actually, uh, you know, the worst thing that we can do because we don't let God work. We don't let him um, do his, his, um, his wonders inside of us. It's like, it's, it's like he has deposited a beautiful thing inside of us and we're just like, 
I don't, I, I can't believe that this is just for me. So uh, Galatians 2, 6, verses 6, uh, verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Here we go, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Uh, even we have believed in Jesus that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. So, um, so by uh, the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Right? So we are not looking at the commandments of Moses. We are not looking at doing and, and, and striving and, 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 and struggling to do. We are just doing a Jesus who's done it and we rest. Amen. So man is declared righteous or justified only through the redemptive work of Christ. Romans 3.24 says that being justified freely by his grace. There again, the grace is everything. It's a gift. It was given to us even though we didn't uh, you know, deserve anything. But he loved us and he saw it as very deserving. And he gave it to us. So um, hallelujah. This is, um, this is great. So Christ is the end of the law and the beginning of true righteousness. And Romans 10, 4 says also that. Can you please read Titus 3, 5? Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Oh, the ministry of the Holy Spirit towards the lost is a threefold ministry. Um, John 16, 8, he says that he came, that he will reprove the word of sin and then of righteousness and of judgment. Why will he do that? Well, he will convict the word uh, because sin, um, why, why of sin? Because people did not, uh, did not and still don't believe in, uh, in Jesus. So the main sin that they are guilty of is rejecting the Son of God. And um, about righteousness, um, Jesus says, because I go to my Father and you will see me no more. And the judgment, the third, um, the third uh, that is mentioned, is because the prince of the world is judged. And because for God, uh, we are all worth, you know, being saved. We are all just wonderful creatures. We were all made by him. So um, he wants us not to perish, but, but live with him through uh, eternity. Uh, faith, of course, is also the key to receive from God. From God, faith and confession uh, is what is necessary when you decide to accept Jesus in your life. And Romans 10:10 10, 10 says so. That with the heart, there again, not with your mind, not with your intellect. Okay, it has to be something that comes from the heart. A uh, man believes into righteousness, and with the mouth, you confess that he's God and that he's the Son of God and that he died and that he is a resurrection. And that uh, brings you into salvation. There are three kinds of unbelief. Uh, unfortunately, for people who are not aware of, uh, of uh, Jesus, is simply because they don't know. So um, it says here in Mark 12, 24, that uh, you err because you know not the scriptures. And um, you also can be wrongly informed. And uh, we know that out there, there are some people who are telling things that are not the truth at all. Um, so it's really easy to be misinformed or, or misled. Uh, so um, that could be also a kind of unbelief. And uh, you can also know the truth and choose to reject Jesus. And Mark 7, 10, 9 says that, And he said unto them, Fool, well, you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. So some people, out of pride, out of well, whatever motives, uh, they just choose to uh, reject Jesus.